Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Greater Miami Chamber, March 2021 virtual trustee luncheon. I'm Alfred Sanchez. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Miami Chamber, and we're really excited to have you here with us today. It's going to be a robust and uh, very engaging program, uh, and I hope it'll be a real shot in the arm. So uh, today's conversation was going to re revolve around the COVID vaccine, uh, you know, it's uh, it's efficacy, it's distribution, the politics of inoculating an entire community. So I think it's going to be extremely, extremely important conversation, and obviously very timely. Uh, I think you all saw in the paper today the um, the article about uh, Publix and and uh, you know it, it's it's we're, we're seeing ourselves through the forest for the first time in 100 years. So uh, there's a lot to discuss, a lot to deal with. Um, with us today, we have some incredible special guests. We've got the uh, experts in the medical community, some of the top people. We have uh, members of the mayor's office, the Day County uh, Commission, uh, experts who have, uh, you know, been in the thick of it and are dealing with uh, the issues day to day and charting new uh, new course and new territory and we're really happy to have them doing so on our community's behalf and happy to have them here with us today to talk a little bit about it. Um, as you all know by now, uh, we've got everyone on mute, uh, but your participation is extremely important and highly encouraged. Uh, Chamber's about uh, inter interacting with one another. And so please use the chat function to talk with one another. If you have uh, things you want to share, a link or whatever, put that there. Also be on the lookout because as we're talking, uh, our chamber staff and staff behind the scene will be dropping important links and information in there as well. So be on the lookout for that. If you have a question, and this is all about getting to your questions, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A section, because only those are going to make it up to the panelists uh, in, in, in our discussion today. All right, so today's session is being recorded. Uh, we are going to post that on our site later on. So if you want to go back and review some of that uh, or tell a friend, hey, listen, there's some good information you want to pay attention to, you can go visit our site at uh, miamichamber.com. Uh, okay. So in keeping with that, remember that no portion of today's program can be used without consent of the chamber. Please contact us if you would like to use that. All right, so let's get out the show on the road, turning the, turning the stage over to my amazing chair uh, from FPL, Irene White. Irene, it's all yours. Thank you, Alfred. I also am very excited to get a shot in the arm. I think we're all ready for that. Uh, and uh, welcome all to our March trustee luncheon 2021. I do think, as Alfred said, this is gonna be a very exciting and informative luncheon. You know, we can't bring you good content like this without our sponsors. So I would like to acknowledge our title sponsor, Florida Power and Light. And I'm going to turn it over to Baldwin English, who is the Florida Power and Light External Affairs Manager. So Baldwin, right, go right ahead, sir. Thank you, Irene. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of FPL, Florida Power and Light, we're very happy to continue our support and sponsorship of this great luncheon. And I personally can't wait until uh, hopefully sometime later this year, we're able to meet in person again. Uh, at FPL, Florida Power and Light, our, I mean, power is literally our little, our, our middle name, but we, uh, we, we always consider ourselves an innovative technology company our approach to how we deliver powers through a lens of innovation uh, that helps us to grow as we've done, but also helps us to provide value to our customers, which is uh, at this point 30% lower than the national average. Uh, one of the recent ways that we have shown how we deploy innovative technology, we just announced it last week through the deployment of 25,000 smart switches, that smart switch technology, and that's 25,000 just here in Miami-Dade County alone. And what that smart switch uh, technology allows us to do is to respond faster to outages in the area. If you consider, uh, for those of us of a certain age that remember the old fuse boxes, you'd have to, if the fuse went out, you have to go and change the fuse. Well, this technology allows us to do, uh, it, it goes beyond our breakers today. Now today, if your power goes out or you have a breaker issue, you have to go to the box and flip the switch. What this new smart switch technology allows us to do is for that switch to take place remotely. 
So, for example, in Irma, when we first deployed this uh, technology, uh, we were able to restore uh, over 500,000 uh, customers who went out without even having to deploy some of our uh, man units out there because it was able to be restored remotely. So that, able, that enables us to restore power quickly. It keeps our um, linemen safe from the dangerous storm winds and uh, allows us to be way more responsive than we have been in the past. Uh, this innovation also extends to how we generate energy. You know, when we started out generating energy almost Almost 100 years ago, we used ice and uh, 35 mules to somehow generate energy. I still don't understand how that worked, but it, it worked back then. Uh, today, we are in the middle of our 30 by 30 program, which is 30 million panels, solar panels within the state of Florida by uh, 2030. We're executing this plan by deploying uh, solar arrays, solar farms all throughout the state, and they're already in the process of producing clean, reliable energy. And solar energy doesn't work unless you, doesn't work as efficiently as possible unless you, unless you compare it or partner it with uh, battery technology. So right here in Wynwood, uh, we have a huge battery complex that allows us to, to store the energy that's generated throughout the day to be able to be deployed and pushed into the grid at night. Uh, in addition to that, we are in the process of developing what will be the world's largest battery right here within the state of Florida. This is helping us uh, pave the way uh, as the most, uh, as, a, as the cleanest and most reliable energy company really in the world as part of the NextEra family. Uh, in addition to that, what we're looking for is, the, is being able to leverage the use of hydrogen in our plants. And uh, the beautiful thing about hydrogen is, hydrogen is that we're able to use it in many of our plants that exist today. And the only thing that it lets out at the end of the day is oxygen. So we're making every step towards uh, an innovative, clean energy uh, future. And it all starts right here in Florida. Uh, I, I'd like to end with a short video. Many of you have seen some of the video that we were able to show during Super Bowl, uh, the most recent Super Bowl. That video will also show a little bit more than what was in the video, that what was shown in the Super Bowl because, you know, 30 seconds, uh, well, you know how that goes. So this is, runs about a minute. I hope you enjoy the video and I look forward to a very uh, thoughtful conversation today. We're always looking the future straight in the eye. When the future said a cut back on foreign oil, we tore down the old plans and made way for clean, American-made natural gas. Then it said reach for the sun, so we reached our right. With more solar panels than anyone, we absorb the sun's energy, convert it, and even store it for later. Then the future asked, can we be even more reliable? We can, we gotta. And when it said we'll need zero carbon emissions, we said, okay, let's make energy from this water. It's called green hydrogen. Just grab some sun, add water, and there, cleaner energy for all of us. So we keep planning, preparing, investing, because Florida deserves, my generation deserves a future we can depend on. Looking pretty good to me. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Baldwin. And thank you, FPL, for continuing to uh, sponsor our trustee luncheons. And I also want to thank the uh, South Florida Business Journal for being a supporting sponsor of our luncheon today. You know, we, uh, we're excited to move forward with uh, our two panels as, Af as Alfred spoke about them. Uh, we were going to have Mayor Levine Cava uh, join us. Unfortunately, she did get pulled away uh, to some business in Tallahassee, but she said, I'm going to tape something, tape a message for everyone. So with that, if I could go ahead and cue the video, please, from Mayor, Mayor Kava. Here we go. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Kava, and I am thrilled to be 
with all of you once again as we continue working together to rebuild our local economy and create greater opportunity for all of our residents and businesses. I want to begin by thanking Chamber President Al Sanchez, Chairwoman Irene White, and all the members of the Greater Miami Chamber who work so hard to uplift our business community. Since taking office 100 days ago this week, my top priority has been to protect the lives and livelihoods of our residents. Miami-Dade County is continuing to work around the clock with our partners at hospitals, cities, the state, and federal government to vaccinate eligible residents as fast as we get more supplies. It's critical that we build a countywide vaccine distribution effort that is efficient and equitable. A community as diverse as ours means that we cannot take a one size fits all approach to our vaccination program. We focused on meeting our residents where they are and we are working with many community partners, in particular nonprofits and the faith community, to help bring vaccines to the hardest to reach communities. That's why we launched a pre registration system available in English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole, where seniors 65 plus and healthcare workers can sign up to receive updates and appointments as fast as we receive new vaccines, and we're encouraging others to register as well as eligibility continues to expand to the 50 plus population uh, and others with comorbidities. Over 150,000 people have signed up already through this system and we are eager to receive more vaccines so that we can book appointments for all those who are waiting. Every day we're continuing our efforts to expand Miami-Dade's mobile vaccination program, building on the work we have been doing since December to administer vaccines to the most vulnerable in our community. We've already brought our mobile vaccine unit directly into neighborhoods to administer vaccines on site at public housing locations, and we look forward to ramping up and expanding into all parts of the county. To date, over 320,000 shots have been administered countywide, and we continue to urgently need more vaccines so we can expand our efforts to all eligible residents. We're very excited that the federal government is opening one of four federal vaccination sites in Florida, right here at Miami-Dade College North Campus, the latest indication that we are steadily moving in the right direction. The federal retail pharmacy program is also expanding with the recent news that vaccines are available at Publix Pharmacies, Navarro and CVS Imas in Miami-Dade. Our website, miamidade.gov slash vaccine, aggregates all the latest updates and information about where vaccines are available countywide. And this week, the governor announced that vaccine eligibility is expanding to include long-term care facility residents and staff, K-12 to school employees 50 years and older, sworn law enforcement officers 50 years and older, and firefighters 50 years and older. Along with those 65 plus and healthcare workers with direct patient access, who, uh, who have already been uh, eligible. Expanding vaccine eligibility and distribution is how we will protect our community and finally put the pandemic behind us. And that's why we are also developing a public relations campaign to educate and persuade all corners of our community about the importance of taking the shot, which will ramp up in the coming weeks as vaccine supply expands. That's something we will absolutely need everyone's help to achieve and to push out. So stay tuned for more details. In the meantime, my administration is working hard to shepherd our economy through the final stretch of this crisis. This week, the new Emergency Rental Assistance Program, or ERAP, launched to deploy $60 million of federal relief funds to support residential landlords and tenants up to $3,000 per month of back rent payments from March 2020 to the present. Help us spread the word about this program, which you can learn more about at miamidade.gov slash COVID help. And the registration is open through March 15th. 
I'm also working to make engagement a core pillar of my administration and bring our government closer to the residents we serve. Last month, we launched our Thrive 305 initiative, a historic civic engagement campaign to seek input directly from our residents and to inform my priorities and policies into the future. I'm excited to begin going over the data. Now that the survey is complete, over 26,000 residents took the survey, and thanks to all of you who have made your voices heard. There is no doubt that building a local economy that works for all of our residents takes all of us, government, nonprofit, business partners, and leaders like all of you. And uh, there's one thing we know for certain, the people of Miami-Dade County do extraordinary work in moments of greatest challenge. And I know this challenge will be no different. And I am full of optimism for the future that we are creating together. I want to thank you all once again for having me here today. And I look forward to continuing our work together to build a stronger, more resilient Miami-Dade County. Thank you. So as, as you know, uh, the mayor has been a longtime member of our chamber, uh, decades really of membership with our chamber. So we're so very happy to have her continue uh, doing this work uh, through our chamber and also her dedication to our community. I also am filled with uh, a lot of optimism, I, hence the, uh, the green dress. Uh, we're 17 days from spring. I do think that March, April, and May is going to really be game changing for our community. I am also very excited about what comes forward. So with that, I am my pleasure to introduce the first panel. And our panel will be moderated by Ben Karnark. And he is the healthcare reporter for the Miami Herald, El Nuevo Herald. Ben is a reporter covering the uh, coronavirus, corona pandemic for the Miami Herald. He joined as a healthcare reporter in August of 2019. Little did he know what was coming around the corner, right? Uh, previously, Karnak was an investigative reporter covering criminal justice at the Florida Times Union. And for panel number two, we have two very distinguished doctors who will be speaking to us and imparting their knowledge and insights on this. We have Dr. Peter Page, who is the Chief Medical Officer, Miami-Dade County, and Chief Physician Executive and Chief Clinical Officer for Jackson Health System. He joined the Jackson Health System in 2019. Uh, Dr. Page is responsible for the oversight of quality and patient safety at Jackson, one of the nation's largest and most respected public health care systems. Uh, Dr. Uh, Page oversees the emergency management and disaster programs for the hospital, including managing outbreaks and infectious disease concerns. He was named and appointed Miami-Dade County first chief medical officer by Mayor Levine Cava uh, to serve as a top medical advisor and to help lead the mayor's administration, uh, coronavirus response and recovery effort, and obviously uh, a very important challenge indeed. And also we will have Dr. David Andrews. David Andrews has been leading the team of researchers at the University of Miami working to detect variants of the coronavirus. His team has made headlines uh, finding and tracking uh, what is called a potpourri of variants in our community. His efforts are critical uh, to the early detection of new strains following allowing our leaders to be more effective in tackling the virus and making all the right decisions. So with that, welcome gentlemen, and I turn it over to you to Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you uh, so much, Irene. I actually uh, just got a visitor outside my apartment. It's the garbage truck, and I might have to ask Jimmy Morales later what it is about Miami Beach that has so many different garbage trucks. It's like every day there's a different garbage truck outside. Um, but thank you all for, for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, we've got two of Miami's best health experts here, so I wanted to jump right into it. Um, these are two doctors who I've relied heavily upon uh, over the last year, really, in helping our readers understand uh, this pandemic. 
And, you know, the fact is we're kind of at an inflection point here in South Florida. Uh, cases and hospitalizations have been looking a lot better, um, but we also know that there are more infectious variants and other concerning variants spreading right now in South Florida, actually quite a few of them, um, as we wrote about today. Uh, so I wanted to turn it over uh, to start off with Dr. Andrews. Um, Dr. Andrews, you've been a, a leader in Florida when it comes to this kind of work, uh, and I was hoping you could give us a rundown of what various uh, variants are on your radar and what we should know about them. Yes, um, thanks a lot, Ben. I, um, I did have a little uh, one slide to present as kind of an infographic. One of our undergraduates helped me put together a nice uh, visual for this. Yes, thank you very much. So we have been, uh, of course, our department under the leadership of Dr. Jorda has been doing a lot of testing like most systems. We're now at a significant capacity. We're, we're running almost 2000 tests a day to be able to also uh, perform surveillance on the, um, on the University of Miami undergraduate students. But more recently, our, our attention has, has, has switched to tracking the gene variants. We're fortunate to have a, uh, now a sequencing pipeline opened up under uh, uh, Dr. Nimer's leadership and with Dr. Sean Williams running the sequencing operation. So with that background, I can tell you that our, in the last month or so, we've really got this, uh, this data just emerging before our eyes. It's very, it's been fascinating to see. It, it is probably relevant to report. Most people may not be aware, unless they've read the paper, that we are turning up about 25% of this UK variant in our current patient population. These are samples that are selected just random positive samples from Jackson Health Healthcare System. I might, I might, I might add that Jackson, we're, we're, we're benefiting from Jackson's significant penetration in the community, both in the North, the South, and at Jackson Memorial, at Jackson, Maine, in addition to U Health samples. So we take the positive samples, positive for the virus, and we're testing those for variants. And we have turned up 25% uh, UK variant in that group. Well, thanks for that uh, rundown, Dr. Andrews. That was, that was really helpful. I, I wanted to turn over to Dr. Page. Um, you know, we just discussed some of these variants. I was hoping you can maybe give us your perspective on, on how these strains of the virus affect uh, operations at the hospital. Um, you know, I think a lot of the questions, and I know it's hard to, uh, to forecast these things, but a lot of the questions people have is, you know, does the spread of this more infectious variant uh, hint at a potential fourth wave? And also, you know, given the fact that we've done a, a decent job vaccinating people over 65 here, I think more than half of the county 65 and older residents are now uh, have at least one dose. So is it also possible that a fourth wave might look different than the last three that we've uh, been through? So I was hoping you could kind of share the, the hospital perspective with us, uh, Dr. Page. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Um, Long question to start off with, but I'll do my best. If I miss anything, just uh, toss me a reminder. I think the first thing um, to make everyone aware of, you know, variants are normal in these viruses. <clears throat> we anticipate that we're gonna get more. A lot of them come and go very quickly. Some of them persist longer. Uh, a lot of them have different characteristics. You had, you had mentioned about transmissibility. The UK virus is said to have a 40 to 70% um, higher transmissibility rate. You know, there's questions about the severity of illness from these variants, but I think from the hospital perspective, you know, we're still taking uh, this matter very serious. I mean, we're still in the pandemic. You know, there's a lot of positive movement in some of the numbers. You talk about the positivity rate across the county that has consistently decreased over the past couple of months. It's still not down to where we'd like to see it below 5%, um, but it's heading in the right direction. Our inpatient positive cases across the county are, are also decreasing uh, by as much as 18% in the past couple of weeks. Um, but there are a few caveats. And one is that our critical care um, population, our, our admitted intensive care patients positive for COVID is pretty flat. Uh, so the, the real decrease is the medical surgical population, um, which, and we're still seeing a lot of very sick people. So I, you know, I, I say that not to scare people, but just to reassure them that we're definitely not out of the woods yet. I, I think that the, the second thing I would say, following up on the positivity rates and the, and the positive trends is that we do have these variants, you know, and there's a lot of testing, a lot of studies going on right now to see how the vaccines are gonna impact these variants. You know, obviously the first three vaccines out are, have very high efficacy rates and very uh, significant improvement as far as 
preventing hospitalizations, deaths, severe disease. Um, but it's, it's been really created towards the original. Uh, it seems to be effective. All three of them seem to be pretty effective against the UK variant, but the other variants are being studied. And I know uh, Dr. Andrews comment in more detail about, you know, the actual efficacy that they're finding so far, but, you know, all these things are changing. This is a, a constantly evolving platform. Um, you know, and I always warn people, you know, we are in the midst of spring break. You know, March is a crazy spring break month for us in Miami-Dade, and we have holidays coming up. Um, and we are seeing increased people uh, in our communities, in downtown Miami, Miami Beach, uh, Brickell area. And all of those things are still factors that um, could have a potential impact on us. When you talk about a next surge, you know, there's predictive analytics being utilized by different groups. Some are seeing one coming in the middle of March. Some are seeing one come in the middle of April. Um, I don't think we really know. Uh, you know, I think that the vaccines, as you alluded to, are definitely going to help. And I think that they're probably going to help blunt some of the requirements for hospitalization and some of the people that get really, really sick, especially the high, highest risk population. But we still got a long ways to go. Uh, one other comment I'd make, you know, you raise a great point, you know, we've done really well with the greater than 65 year old population with vaccinations in Miami-Dade County. You know, the approach being as coordinated and, and as consistent as possible between the county, the state, and the hospital systems, and the clinics is going to be critical as well as the retail establishments that are doing the vaccination. So long answer to a long question, but if I missed anything, just let me know. I think you hit all the points and, and thank you, Dr. Page. You alluded to the, the next question I have for Dr. Andrews, which is, you know, what, what can you tell us, Dr. Andrews, about vaccine efficacy? I know that there's been a lot of concern. Uh, could you help put that into perspective for us, given the new variant? Yes, it's, it's a perfect segue. Would you mind reprojecting the slide? I think I'll, I'll be able to pick up on Dr. Page's comments. The good, I will reiterate what Dr. Page said, if you get the slide back up that all of the vaccines that are in use right now work are effective against this UK variant. Uh, it is the one that is, there is concern for the UK variant and that it is more transmissible. When it arrives in a location, it typically spreads and replaces what, we're, what I'll refer to as the original Wuhan or the, 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 the parental strain. And we're already seeing that. Uh, we've already, in, just from this time point, it's, it's up over 30% in our latest uh, analysis. But fortunately, the vaccines work against that. So if we break down this pie chart without trying to be too technical, even if this were, were even if the green were to become all blue with the UK variant, the vaccines work against the, the UK variant. Let me add also that even the gray here, the gray I, I've annotated as gray, just out of fascination uh, to illustrate the genetic diversity of the variants we have in South Florida, we are turning up variants by the way, in that group, these are variants that we can tell from molecular footprints and molecular fingerprints, if you will, that are that originated in other locations, but they're here. They are not uh, clinically of concern. They are not resistant to vaccines. They're not uh, more aggressive. We don't believe so. They're just we just can tell from the molecular fingerprint where they come. If you notice in, in the in the in the list, these are these these are variants from Aruba, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, they, they are from, of course, different, different flavors, if you will, from the United Kingdom. Some of these are from Mexico, from Switzerland, from Belgium, from India. And I think it just underscores uh, how much of an international city we are. Now, let me conclude here about describing the variants of concern. And that's what we, we really need to keep an eye on that group. In our, in our first, of, first several weeks of uh, doing a genomic sequencing of the virus, we have turned up the ones, the variants that are able to uh, show resistance to uh, vaccines, of which, but as Dr. Page alluded, the two major uh, companies, Moderna and Pfizer, are already making vaccines to address these strains. But these are the ones we are starting to turn up. Two of the, uh, the what, of the of the Brazilian variant, the P1 variant, we've turned up in Miami-Dade County. The state of Florida also turned up a third case. So those are three individual cases of the Brazilian variant that have been identified in Miami-Dade County. We also turned up. California variants. We've turned up one case of the New York variant. So these are very low numbers in our rough statistics here without, uh, we don't have thousands of specimens. We have hundreds here. Rough In our rough estimate, it's probably less than 5% of those variants. Actually, I did read in the paper, I learned 
through the media that, that a South African variant. So these are, has been identified in the Tampa area. So I'll just conclude here with the everything that's out there now is responsive and, 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 and the vaccines work against those. But we, we do have to pay close attention to these other variants uh, and monitor them uh, and get ahead of the curve. Uh, I guess it's the last thing I should say is that the, the vaccines have partial effectiveness against these variants of concern. It's not like it's a, not like they don't work at all. It's just reduced effectiveness. So we're, we're gonna have to continue to monitor. Uh, and I, I think just not to send a, a fear, a huge fear factor down in, in the population. The, you know, the vast majority of the, of the virus that's out there, of course, fortunately it's all going down is responsive to the current uh, vaccines that are on the market. Thank you so much. Just a quick follow-up for that, Dr. Andrews. I mean, what does this mean practically for us? Are we looking at booster shots? Are we looking at a yearly COVID shot, uh, like we get our flu shot? I, I, I do believe that if um, the, all of the booster shots several months from now will include coverage, at least from Moderna and Pfizer, will likely include coverage for the for these other variants in addition to the to the they call the Wuhan strain, the, the parental strain. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would suspect, and this is just a speculation, that we are going to be uh, getting vaccinated down the road again for uh, coronavirus, but that's just an opinion. I, I don't know for sure. That's fair. I know uh, you are a pathologist, not an immunologist, but um, I will you know take the moment to point out that um, you guys are all having a glimpse of the, the privilege I have as a healthcare reporter for the Miami Herald to get to kind of pick the brains of, of folks like Dr. Page and, and Dr. Andrews. And I also think it's worth noting, um, this is another example of a partnership between two of Miami's biggest healthcare institutions, the University of Miami and, and Jackson Health, who have been working uh, really closely. And, you know, hospitals in general in, in Miami-Dade, there's been an unprecedented uh, level of coordination and cooperation between our county's biggest um, healthcare providers here over the last year. D uh, Dr. Page, how has that worked? And, and I mean, you've been, uh, you know, communicating. I know that a lot of these calls are at the CEO level, uh, but uh, what's your perception of, of uh, this, this level of co uh, cooperation between hospitals and, and will that last into the future? You know, it's a great, great topic, Ben. We've, um, We've done a lot, you know, I, I got down here, um, as I had mentioned previously, I think in our prior discussions in 2013, and um, I feel like the relationship with the University of Miami, for example, is the strongest it's ever been. Uh, constantly communicating, collaborating. I mean, this is just one example of many uh, where we work together to try to, you know, achieve the best, um, you know, medical care we can for our community and be protective, uh, but also forward thinking. I think that the other fun part um, that's really taken off over this past several months is the collaboration between health systems in South Florida and even beyond. You know, we have conversations and some of our specialists have conversations with people in other states and other countries all around the world to try to pick their brains on what they've experienced. You know, we've all been at different points of the pandemic at different times. People have seen different things, found different things that have worked. Um, I've been really impressed, um, you know, with that level of collaboration, even extending out of South Florida. We do have South Florida CMO Council that meets uh, now every other week uh, that I uh, am lucky enough to oversee and, and kind of help lead. Uh, great input from a lot of the hospitals and health systems across South Florida. Very smart people, very forward thinking people. So. I think that's going to continue, and I think it's only going to get stronger um, as we continue to face different challenges in healthcare going forward. Thanks, Dr. Page. Um, you know, we all know that the business community is, is really, I think, like everyone, interested in, in a return to normalcy or, or something approaching normalcy, at least. And I want to ask both of you uh, along these lines what type of factors businesses would be considering as we get further along towards that return to normalcy. Um, Dr. Andrews, you know, given your, your background, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about testing. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of advancements in COVID testing, but we've also seen kind of a, a, the similar uh, infrastructure that we've had since July um, and August in place here in South Florida. There hasn't been a lot of at-home testing or, or rapid diagnostics. I mean, do you see a bigger role for that in the future? What kind of what's taken so long to, to get us there? And do you think vaccines might um, 
you know, disincentivize the development of these at-home tests, or do you think we're going to need them anyway? I'm just curious to kind of get your thoughts on, on the diagnostics aspect of this. So the, the rapid tests that we do have are reasonably well deployed. These are, it's a category of tests called the antigen test. I'll try not to get too techni technical here. And that test has strengths and limitations. It, when it's positive, it does give you an immediate result and you can act, the patient can act and be isolated and you can move down that, that pathway of them being positive, but they're not as sensitive. So they don't pick up uh, people who are carrying very low copies of virus. I, could, I do know, because I'm in the thick of this, that the, uh, the menu, there, there's a lot of brain power in the American manufacturing industry, a lot. And uh, it, it actually underscores the formidable difficulty it is to produce a quality uh, molecular test, a PCR test, that can give you a quick result rapidly that can be deployed uh, out in the community. We have those tests. Several health systems have tests. I'm not going to mention manufacturer names. Th these tests are available, but they're more laboratory-based tests. There is a need for, uh, uh, for a test, that, you know, an instrument, a small, a portable instrument or something that could be put on a cart that could get out into the community, get to the schools. Uh, that there, I mean, many people are trying, but it's not easy to do. And just as a follow-up to that, I mean, do, do the variants factor in here too? If we're seeing, you know, mutations in the, in the the kind of targets of the virus that we have for diagnostics, are we looking at potentially having to retool our diagnostics as well? For for the vast majority of the tests that are in use, that fortunately they have multiple targets. Uh, only a few. Uh, have a single target, even the manufacturers that make tests that are targeting one target that have worked re reliably are, are rapidly de developing their test to, to add a second one. But the, all of the major players out there have multiple targets. Uh, and they are, by the way, they're also monitoring and providing updates to users regarding a variant strains that could be affected. So let's take a worst case scenario. If you have three targets and you lose one, the test is still valuable for making a diagnosis. A lot of a, a question that's been coming to me uh, a lot is, and I'll just throw it out, you haven't asked it, uh, will, we, will we be testing routinely for variants in clinical samples? And I, I could imagine that happening in, in the, not tomorrow, not next week, but in, in, the, in, the, in the near term where people may want to know if they're carrying a strain uh, that, especially if it's a strain that's been found to be more virulent. We don't have strong evidence yet that a particular test or, or even a variant can, can identify a strain that's more aggressive and more and more virulent. You know, I can imagine this this might have some clinical uh, meaning and that there will be demand for those kinds of tests, but but we're not quite there yet either. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. That was uh, fascinating. Um, Dr. Page, what, what sort of mitigations are, are you foreseeing uh, businesses will need this summer uh, as we hopefully move closer to, to something that looks like a normal uh, summer in South Florida. Uh, what do you think that's going to look like um, for businesses? I mean, we, we've obviously adjusted a lot in, in the last year, but um, is there more we need to do or is there maybe less we need to do going forward? You know, I think that I think we're status quo for the next few weeks to potentially a couple of months. I think that there's too many variables out there right now that that we had mentioned previously that put us at, you know, continued risk um, as we go through this vaccination process. Uh, the vaccines are only going to help us. Uh, the more vaccines we can get out there, the more people we can get protected. You know, obviously, the, the lower the risk profile is going to be. I think that you're going to hear us continue our mantra, you know, of masking, social distancing, hand hygiene, avoiding crowds, trying to hang out outside instead of inside, you know, based on ventilatory questions and, and concerns, um, and really trying to maintain our vigilance that I think to some extent has helped us to get to where we are now with some of these decreasing rates. You know, we're going to be challenged by some of the activities, you know, we're a natural tourist spot. People love to travel down here, especially this time of year. Uh, some of the people that travel down here aren't going to be as vigilant as we would like them to be or as we have hopefully become. Um, and we're going to have some, you know, potentially ongoing challenges, as I mentioned, and, and Dr. Andrews has mentioned with the variants, holidays and gatherings and those kind of things. So I think it's going to be status quo for a little bit. You know, obviously, we're all cautiously optimistic that 
we're going to continue heading in the in the positive direction. I think we may see you know another surge or two, but I think they're going to be hopefully much less significant than obviously the one we had last summer, um, because of all the factors that we talked about. So I, I think right now we're 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 looking at trying to be patient as possible and asking people um, to to maintain their patience, and we're data driven. You know, we're going to be using data. We're going to be using positivity rates, case case rates, critical care rates, hospitalizations, uh, hospital capacity, uh, influenza and COVID-like illnesses. You know, all those things are going to be factoring into our decision making going forward. But we're fortunate, at least at this point, to be as open as we are now from the business perspective. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Page that the summer surge. Uh, you know, we spoke a lot back then, and it was pretty scary. Um, you know, there, but there was also a lot of reports that Miami-Dade hospitals had hit ICU capacity. Although from our conversations, you know, I, I knew that never quite happened. We got close. Um, it was a it was a pretty hairy situation, as I'm sure you recall. But I mean, could you tell folks kind of how close we came to that? situation and and kind of what lessons you took away from that uh the ability of a respiratory pandemic to kind of nearly overwhelm even the very large infrastructure that we have uh here in miami-dade yeah you know i i thought you know given all the uh all the challenges related to the pandemic i thought the uh south florida and miami-dade healthcare systems did a great job um the, the staff was phenomenal doctors nurses respiratory therapists ancillary staff. I mean, it's just an amazing uh, response to a very challenging situation. I think that as with a lot of different parts of the country and the world, it, it caught us off guard. I don't think people were ready or prepared for that kind of pandemic. Um, and it moved quickly, you know, and it, it, the transmission was, you know, pretty out of control. You know, we got busy, we got busy, you know, um, and I can speak from, you know, from our health system perspective, you know, in combination, obviously, with our colleagues from UM, you know, we tend to rise to the occasion when challenges like this hit us, especially in a, in a public health scenario. Um, but I was also impressed with how a lot of the other hospitals and health systems across the county responded as well. So I think we learned from it, you know, and I think that we're hopeful that um, the lessons learned, you know, when you look back and you talk, you mentioned testing previously. And I, I won't speak for Dr. Andrews because he knows it much better than I, but I mean, the testing platforms changed so dramatically from the beginning of this to where we are now. Treatment platforms, you know, um, what we do with patients in the ICU is how we manage their oxygenation, their position. I mean, there, there's so much that we've learned from this um, over the course of the past several months that I have to feel that we're going to be better prepared. Now, granted, these things are so unpredictable and could be so significant that I wouldn't ever want to be overconfident and say we'd be able to handle any challenge um, to the same extent. But, you know, we're, uh, we're going to be as ready as we can be. And I, I think that we've learned a lot. I don't know, Dr. Andrews, if you want to add anything to the uh, evolving side of that over the past several months. Yeah, I, I agree that it's been, um, there have been an, an unbelievable learning opportunities. We've gotten better as, as we've gone along. Uh, this has been a theme in, in everywhere and in, in, in at, at the level of testing, test choice, utilization, dealing with our continuing, even to this day, supply chain problems. Uh, we, there's a lot of demand still for testing, and we, we really struggled to keep up with the demand by, by, by shifting testing between one platform and, or another. I tell you that one of the most uh, uplifting parts of this has been the the, the legit, the, the genuine collaboration uh, from all parts of the hospital uh, uh, teamwork. Uh, we get involved in typically in difficult cases, difficult categories of cases. We all we all come together. We decide on strategies how to, and then you know make things better. Uh, we, we we deal with it. We move it. We we move on to try and try and incrementally improve uh, the, the the delivery of care. It's been very very uplifting. Obviously for for all of us, it's going to be a memorable part of our lives. Well, I love that you both are sharing questions now. It makes my job a little bit easier. And on that note, um, if any of you have questions, we have about four minutes left in this panel. Uh, this is a great opportunity to ask two of the smartest medical experts locally what, what they think. Um, I, I mean, I think this is another question that could go to both of you. Um, you know, we were, we were talking a little bit about this, Dr. Andrews, just now, but 
what are some of the important lessons learned from this pandemic? I know you, you have learned lessons and what could we have done better? Um, and, and what do you think are the biggest concerns going forward? We could start with you, Dr. Page, but I, you know, Dr. Andrews mentioned the, the supply chain. Um, I think that might be one, right? That, that we might need to, to take another look at our supply chain for, for pandemic emergencies like this. And, you know, I'm also coming to mind a, a staffing, you know, that was in July, that was pretty scary. We were, we were pretty much running out of nurses. And I know there's, you know, diff, there's ebbs and flows in the nursing pipeline, so to speak, but maybe it's a physician shortage we're concerned about. I'm just curious to kind of get your thoughts about those two aspects and anything else you thought might be relevant. Are you going to go first, Dr. Andrews, or do you want me to? I said, ahead, Dr. I said Dr. Page first. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Page, that's a, that's a big question for you, Dr. Page, I think. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's a great question. And, um, you know, we've talked about this a lot, thought about it a lot. Um, you know, uh, this was a very challenging stretch, and it continues to be a challenging stretch. And it's always challenging to look at it retrospectively because there's so many decisions that are made real time that have so many factors that we may not even know were involved in the decision making process. You know, I always look back and I say if there are ways that we could have decreased the community transmission, that would have been a positive, you know, you know, being more consistent, not just in South uh, Florida or in Miami Dade, but across the country and across the world. Um, being a little bit more proactive potentially, you know, when this started and, you know, not, I don't want to say we underestimated it, but with the lack of predictability, being a little bit more aggressive and getting out on the front end. I think when, when you look at some of the challenges we faced once it really hit, I think that some of those things would have been nearly impossible to prepare for because it was just such a strain on the system from a lot of different perspectives, you know, and if, staff turn positive or staff get sick or, you know, staff get recruited to other areas, it's very difficult to prepare for that. So I, I, I'm not quite as, as critical from the staffing side. I, I think that, as I mentioned before, the staff has been amazing. They continue to be amazing. So I, I think that, you know, some people will say, well, we could have maybe advanced the testing and treatment options quicker. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's a really tough question. I, I think that what we have to do now is learn from the whole events and and feel like we're better prepared and be better prepared and know that you know some of these things are going to be some of the challenging issues or areas that we have to be even more prepared for or have a heightened awareness for i think would, would be how i would answer your question ben well thank you for taking the brunt of that hit dr andrews would you would you like to add anything to that you've got about a minute no i actually i just want to that uh, dr page covered everything i do uh Agreed. We're gonna we we'll, we'll just continue to learn from all of the uh, experiences that he described, and that's that's the best we can do is do is to learn and move forward. I, was, I do I do want to give a a real shout out to the to the staff, to the technical staff, and all the support people in the hospital. They they've been unbelievable troopers, and I'm privileged to to have worked with them, and I continue to and to continue to work with them. They uh, they really done a, a a really huge job in in in, in our efforts. Yeah, I think it's worth emphasizing that point. I mean, we all knew that police and firefighters and folks like that protect us every day, but I think there's a much better public awareness now of the work that healthcare workers do to, to protect us every day as well. Um, thank you both for a fantastic discussion. It's great to talk to you again. And uh, yeah, it was just a, a really interesting discussion. So, so thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. All right, well, so we've got one panel uh, coming up now. Uh, this would be the second panel, and we're gonna focus on the, on the political aspects of um, dealing with the virus. So in Miami-Dade, we've had two different mayors um, during this pandemic for the county. Uh, we've seen our public officials wrestle a lot with um, many difficult questions. Um, there have been challenges in the county as far as uh, us getting our fair share of vaccine, um, distributing those doses equally. And you know there are even more difficult questions I think coming up. Um, how do we get everyone to want the vaccine, and, and should government um, incentivize businesses maybe to mandate vaccines? So we're going to go over this with some of our panelists. We have uh, Jimmy Morales here, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Miami-Dade County. Um, he's here representing the county. He's no stranger to any of us, having uh, served as the County Commissioner and City Manager of Miami Beach. Thanks for joining us, Jimmy. It's nice to see you. Um, 
We also have the Honorable Rene Garcia, uh, Miami-Dade County Board of Commissioners, District 13. Uh, Commissioner Garcia has served on the Miami-Dade County Commission since 2020. He's representing the Hialeah area, uh, and he served close to 20 years in the Florida legislature, both in the House and the Senate from 2000 to 2018. So thanks for, thanks for being here. Uh, we're grateful to have you. Um, we also have Dr. Hansel Tooks. Uh, he's an attending physician in infectious diseases um, at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Uh, Dr. Tooks joined the faculty of the UM Miami, uh, UM Miller School of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Uh, and he's one of my favorite people to interview. <laughs> um, and, and we go back. So it's nice to see you, Dr. Tooks. Um, and we also have uh, Rachel Weldesus. Uh, Weldesus, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a senior advisor for innovation and performance to the Miami-Dade County Mayor, uh, Daniela Levine Cava. Um, in other words, it's the chief of staff, I believe, and she's been handling a lot of the COVID issues that come up. Um, so, so thank you all for being here today. Um, I kind of want to start off with, with what I hinted at in the introduction, which I think is going to be a, a major uh, question that we all have to wrestle with, which is, you know, what are we going to do about folks who, who don't want um, a COVID vaccine, right? We kind of need everyone um, on board here, hopefully. So I wanted to start off with you, Rahel. Um, how is the mayor's office viewing this challenge? You know, given the demographics and the layout of our county, it's going to be a slightly different issue here than it might be in, in more rural parts of the state. Um, so I just kind of wanted to check in with you about how the, how the county mayor's office is viewing this issue and and some of the initiatives you all have uh, lined up to, to help us make some inroads here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, Rahel Waldeus is here, uh, a senior advisor, not the chief of staff. Uh, Joanna Stravone is our chief of staff. Sorry <laughs> about that. No worries, not at all. <laughs> um, so the mayor has uh, has been fighting for our, share, yeah, our fair share of vaccine. Um, obviously, a lot of what we do uh, in our communities is contingent on the supply that we have for vaccine. We are a dense urban center. Um, you know, we have been the epicenter of, of the pandemic in, in Florida. Um, so we've had, you know, high rates here. And we really want to make sure that we are able to get the supply that we need. Um, so she's been, you know, in constant communication with the, with the governor's office. We're um, constantly uh, ramping up our, our capacity to provide you know, uh, vaccines as, as uh, efficiently, but as equitably as possible. So um, on the equity side, we have partnered with our community organizations, our faith-based groups to, uh, to actually, matter of fact, we had a community round table with over 160 different community-based groups um, and faith-based groups to, to, uh, that are trusted kind of credible messengers in the community to go ahead and, and uh, reach our, our harder reach populations. And so um, we, we got different feedbacks. We got a variety of, you know, solutions from, from the public. Um, and then we went ahead and incorporated those, uh, those solutions, uh, in our vaccine distribution plan as well. So we are constantly out there. We're doing a, a huge public education campaign, um, in English, Creole, and, and Spanish. We're doing radio print ads, um, and also door-to-door -door canvassing with our, our, with our community organizations. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Tux, I wanted to follow up with you on this because you know we've had a lot of discussions about um, you know health equity here and also vaccine hesitancy. And you know often this this is framed as an issue of vaccine hesitancy, but we also know that hesitancy and access are are intertwined. So I kind of wanted to to throw that to you and just have you kind of um, talk a little bit about how those two aspects of this, interface and, and you know how that's a you know an important part when we talk about rolling out the vaccine and continuing to get more people vaccinated how should we view this issue of, of vaccine hesitancy especially in some of our underserved neighborhoods yeah thanks for that question ben it, it's interesting so the mayor said one of my favorite phrases she said meet people where they're at so as everyone knows i'm a harm reductionist i, I founded the first uh, syringe services program, needle exchange, and the first legal one in the state of Florida. And one of the fundamental principles of harm reduction is meeting people where they're at. So I'm very excited that there are all of these diverse initiatives to reduce barriers to getting the vaccine. The fact that there are all of these partnerships with faith-based faith groups, sororities, all sorts of uh, partnerships that actually account for the majority of the vaccinations that are occurring. 
at, at Jackson Health System now. I'm, I'm really uh, grateful for those partnerships. I was really heartened to hear about the, the uh, mobile unit that the, the uh, mayor's office is deploying. So I think a lot of uh, increasing uptake in the vaccine is going to be making it easier for people to get it. You know, before we made it easy to start HIV medicine at the needle exchange, many people who uh, needed HIV care didn't get it because they didn't have, uh, they were, there were too many barriers to enter the public system, fill out paperwork and all of these things. Once we could start it on the spot in a really easy, comfortable setting, uh, a lot more people entered care and we have to use those same principles. As we, as we roll out the vaccine. As you know, I'm very concerned about uh, vaccine equity and uptake, particularly in uh, black and brown communities. We knew that this was uh, going to be an issue back in 2020 and in partnership with Jackson, we created educational videos uh, specific for different communities. We've held uh, employee facing webinars because of course all of us as health, healthcare providers have to lead by example. That's why I was on TV getting the vaccine <laughs> way back in December, seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, and as we lead by example, uh, people become more comfortable. I've had so many patients say to me, well, if you got the vaccine, I'll get it because I know that you wouldn't do anything that's unsafe. I know that you wouldn't recommend anything for me that you wouldn't recommend for your own family. And so as we lead by example, as we continue these really, uh, this extra investment uh, in uh, educational campaigns and, and partnerships with specific organizations, I think that we will get to, to more vaccine equity. And uh, Jackson has vaccinated over half of the black people in, in Miami who have been vaccinated. So we just have to continue uh, on the same path, you know, revise continuous process improvement, revise any kinks there are in the system and continue to, to move forward. It's a really exciting time having three vaccines, now all of the pharmacy vaccination sites. I mean, I'm, I'm really uh, definitely more hopeful than I've been uh, since that first shot went in my arm back in December. <laughs> it, it is nice to think about that, you know, within the next month or two, everyone here will, will have their chance at, at getting this vaccine that's gonna help us all move forward past this. I wanted to follow up real quick, Dr. Tux, before I move on. Um, you, you talked about the importance of making this easier, right? Uh, we heard a little bit from Rahel about um, what county government's doing to make this easier, but I was curious if you could share for the business community here what you think businesses could do um, to make it easier to get vaccinated. Uh, should they be providing a day off? Should they be providing monetary incentives um, to help folks kind of access this vaccine, especially working class folks? You shouldn't ask me that question. Your doctors are notoriously not good with money, but I'll, I'll attempt. I'll attempt to answer this question. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk in public health spaces about incentivizing uh, vaccine uptake, incentivizing mask use. You know, there, there were discussions about paying people to wear masks um, in, in public health spaces uh, where, I, where I circulate. And so I, I do think it would be uh, important for, for businesses to incentivize uh, uptake of the vaccine the same way businesses incentivize exercise, the same way they uh, incentivize a smoking cessation. But it's very important not to penalize people for not getting the vaccine. People are already struggling. We're all hurt. Mentally, the hurt will be, uh, we will be experiencing it over the next year as it all, uh, you know, we're in the middle of this very traumatic uh, episode, <laughs> uh, event. So, you know, economically, people are really, really struggling. So I just want to make sure that when businesses are thinking about how to increase uptake, that you're not penalizing your employees for not getting the vaccine. You have to find a way to incentivize them to, to get the vaccine, to continue to wear masks because we must all continue to wear masks and must continue to wash our hands. Uh, you see what it did to the flu season. I can't imagine what the pandemic, how it would have uh, unfolded had people not been wearing their masks. So we have to continue, we have to remain vigilant, but there is definitively uh, an end in sight. So I, I am really just uh, hopeful right now. I don't know if I answered your question, hope I did. <laughs> You came close enough, Dr. Tux, but there was a, there was a question from the audience there, uh, I think a clarification and about the 50% number you said, and I believe you mean 50% of the Black folks in Miami-Dade County who have been vaccinated received their vaccine from Jackson Health. Is that correct? That's correct. So uh, our public hospital system obviously treats many people who are immigrants from minority communities, uh, has a, a long history of treating the Black community. My grandma, my uh, inspiration, the nurse right there. It's important for us to, to vaccinate uh, the people that we serve. And so we are going through our, our records and our electronic health record. 
We are texting and calling our patients to let them know that they're eligible for the vaccine. And as we continue to uh, vaccinate our own patients, you're going to see even more and more vaccine equity uh, in our county. Thank you for that. I want to turn to a question from from the audience here. Uh, you know, I'll throw this to uh, to to you, Jimmy or, or Rahel, if if this is better for you. But we have a question from Gail Burks, who is asking um, how you're seeking buy-in for the protocol against COVID without making it punitive. Some of the approaches have been meeting resistance because of uh, such tactics. I mean, this is this goes in line a little bit with something I wanted to ask you, Jimmy. Which you know, you have you've had the experience of working in city government, of working in in county government. I mean, how has this worked uh, for go uh, government officials who are trying to kind of thread this needle of keeping people safe, but also not, you know, suffocating businesses with with a lot of restrictions? Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, two things. One, first of all, with um, and, and hello to everyone. Thank you for having me on. Um, number one, with with government, what we find is um, a lot of folks, you know, are sort of waiting to get test uh, vaccines. They very much want to get them. They're not in line yet. You know, uh, for example, uh, you know, a lot of the departments that are part of my portfolio, uh, I, you know, I work with the bus drivers, the sanitary workers, the, the solid waste workers. They they're all waiting to get vaccinated. They very much want to get vaccinated because they're out there. As essential workers on the front line, so um, a lot of that uh, I think you can get passed by folks who who very much want to, uh, so that they can feel safe in going out. Um, so I, I think we'll, we'll that once we get the number of vaccines to be able to vaccinate all these frontline workers across uh, the way, I, I think you'll you'll get to that a much higher herd immunity voluntarily. I think with respect to the businesses, you know, I think that what I have found, um, you know, including my time in Miami Beach with the economy there is. Um, less, almost more important than whether or not we allow a business to open or, or these, or what are, what is it going to be necessary to get the customers back? And, and I think for a lot of these businesses, they realize, you know, a restaurant can open and many of them are open, but no one wants to sit inside. They'll sit outside. You know, they, uh, and so what is it going to take to get customers to get back indoors in a restaurant? <clears throat> What's it going to take them to get back on airplanes? You know, planes are flying, but again, we're nowhere near, anywhere near where we used to be. And the cruise ships aren't sailing at all, obviously. So I think part of what will drive that is the, the businesses themselves will want uh, their workforce to get uh, not just tested, but vaccinated. They'll want uh, to, I think some of them like cruise ships will probably re set requirements for their passengers so that other passengers will feel comfortable and whether that's testing uh, or getting vaccinated. So I think to some degree, the market will also drive the extent to which people will want to voluntarily participate in order to get back to work and to get back into uh, the mainstream of life. So we're hoping that again, we en engage, we educate, we encourage, but I think the market forces and the desire of people to re-engage with their neighbors will also lead to that. So in other words, if you ever wanna see the Miami heat again, you might have well, to get a vaccine. Well, um, the cruise ship companies are very much talking about at a minimum requiring tests and maybe even requiring vaccines. Uh, in order to really get people comfortable getting back on. And we're, we're actually building infrastructure out at the seaport with a testing facility working with the private sector to uh, make that happen. Uh, thanks for your answer. Um, I, I wanna turn over to Commissioner Garcia. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of hardship, a lot of economic hardship in the, in the last year here in Miami-Dade and, and all throughout the state. Um, you know, county commissioners earlier this month, they approved a, a $61 million program to cover unpaid rent for tenants who've been hurt by the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and that was funded through federal stimulus bill that was passed in December. Um, so that program covers up to $3,000 a month for rent starting back as far as March, 2020. You know, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on how you feel uh, about evictions and the prospect of picking evictions back up given the aid that's available and kind of where you would come down on that issue. You couldn't give me an easy question, right? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Listen, I agree. Look, I, I think this is not the, the time to uh, to evict anyone, especially uh, you know with with how the housing market is, and especially what's happening with uh, the, the pandemic itself. But we have to be careful that we don't overreach. And obviously, here is where government has to have the balance. You know, uh, we had a big discussion the other day on what's happening with squatters in our community. 
Uh, we're having individuals, private individuals uh, who have their homes, who are who currently have squatters who are living in, in these properties. And we are not able to, because of the moratorium that ex exists on, on the evictions, I think there was a misconnect between what uh, the, what the police department was saying, what the mayor's office was saying, what else's county commissions were saying, we're, we're talking about. So I think those are the things that we need to try to balance out when you look at the economics and uh, you can compare the proper, pro private property rights that individuals have uh, with that of, of housing for individuals. So I, I think you have your, your extreme cases, uh, but at the end of the day, we do know, understand that still we're in the middle of the pandemic and econ economic crisis for many. I love when I hear people that they say, oh, I've done great. I don't wanna, I don't wanna talk about it and tell anyone, but my, my, I've been doing great under this pandemic. Yeah, you may be doing great, but I am still having food lines in the city of Hialeah, which we spit, we have not stopped from the beginning of the pandemic. You know, we see in Hialeah, you know, the, the, the positively, thank God the positivity rate is going down, um, but you still see lines of people lining up at Amelia Hard Park for, for a COVID test. So we're not out of it. And you see the reality when you see the amount of people that stand on those food lines, that there's still a need, that there's still an economic crisis going on in our community. So, you know, that's why I credit Washington, D.C. with what they're trying to do. We're trying to pass this package, although I have some criticisms of the package of everything that they put into this package. It should have been really COVID specific and economic um, uh, specific for individuals who are hurting. I like the fact that they've targeted. But the reality is that when, when some of my friends look at me and say, you know, um, uh, you know, these people are going and getting in these lines. They really don't need the food because the cars are driving up. And I don't think anyone on this on this conference call or on this on this webinar is going to sit in line for for 45 minutes or an hour to get a gallon of milk some and some food if they really didn't need it. And that's when I tell folks the need is still really out there. And you see that happening around our community. And I think we we have to do we have to continue to do what we're doing. Look, uh, the the mayor's a Democrat. I'm a Republican, um, and we've had this conversation before where, listen, this is not the time to you know, go against each other. We need to work together. The time will come when we're, we're going to battle, but this is not the time to battle right now. We have to figure out and come up with solutions on how not only how we um, take care of the residents of Miami-Dade County in an economic sense and in a housing sense, but also with the vaccinations. And I have to commend, I really do commend her efforts and, and Mr. Uh, Morales, I really commend all the work you all have been doing in trying to get these vaccines into the community. Look, Jackson Memorial Hospital, I know you're talking about the economics and I'm going off on the vaccine issue, but um, what Jackson Memorial Hospital has been able to do, let me start off with, let me go back. Unfortunately, we all know this, that people with means are always going to find a way to get vaccines, are always going to find a way to get what they need to get. And that's at the beginning of the pandemic, there were some real serious issues with different other hospitals and other healthcare institutions that were receiving this. But what Carlos Magoya did at Jackson Memorial Hospital, that he went into the communities, he tried to reach out and he put uh, tentacles all over the community to try to bring people in. That to me, I mean, I celebrate him and I applauded him yesterday because that has made all the difference in the world. And yes, we got criticized. Some of us got criticized, and I, and I was one of those that got criticized for accepting the hundred vaccines that that, that they uh, gave out to us. But you know what those hundred vaccines did? It didn't go, didn't go to my family and my friends. It went out to make sure that we we, we vaccinated the people in our community. We had waiting lists, and right now I have another waiting list about three hundred people. You know, uh, and this is why we have to work in conjunction with each other. Um, you know, the these you know the biggest criticism that I will have. Uh, of what's happened with the vaccine is that there's so much misinformation out there. We don't know if it's the, if it's a state site, if it's a county site, um, if it's a federal site, and it's everyone's crossing fingers with each other. And I want to go back to what Dr. Took was talking about. The reality is that it's through education. We have to do a better job at educating people. And it's not just a campaign. They may not put up a, a flyer, you know, a little flyer and say, this is, this is what's happening. No. We have to go into our communities. We have to go in and talk to, to the Kiwanis clubs. We have to go in and talk to the different non-for-profits and organizations that are out there and educate individuals about the efficacy and about the safetyness about these vaccines. Because I get it all the time. I get it every single time that when we talk about this vaccine and say, well, you know, it's, it's not safe. 
And it's not just, it's not, a, it's just not party politics. This is maybe, it may draw down on, on ethnic lines for the most part, right? And we have to go out there and always convince individuals it's okay to take it. You know, I'm not going to get be involved in a, in a study that AstraZeneca is doing in Miami Lakes. And I'm going to show people, look, I'm, 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 I'm going to participate in this study because this is what I'm doing. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to, to make sure that we go into our communities, talk to them and educate them, uh, not only on, on the great programs that we have at the county right now, um, you know, as it re re relates to rent assistance and, and to help our small businesses, but also on, on the importance of getting these vaccines. Can I, I, then I just want to jump yes. in here really quickly if that's okay. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to uh, make it clear, we have been evicting squatters. Um, our police department has been you know, actively doing that, which is not the same as those who hold a, a lease or a, a rent agreement, right? So um, that's under the condition of the moratorium. Um, but for, you know, and, and of course the, the program comes with those who can demonstrate, for those who can demonstrate that they, they have experienced COVID hardship. But as far as squatters, which is a different case, we have, our police department has been evicting those. <laughs> Now they're evicting. They, that wasn't that wasn't the case early on. And this is why we had. This is I don't. This right, well, we, it's, working it's working now. So I, I am glad it is. But it was it, that wasn't the case before. And this is why we as government always have to find that balance. You know, obviously, you know, protecting private property rights over you know um, you know and, and the balance of the healthcare and the needs of a community. And that's what I always say where the balance needs to come in. And I appreciate the fact that we now. Are, are, are going after squatters, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for weighing in on that. I will throw uh, Doug Hanks, the county reporter under the bus for suggesting that question. <laughs> um, but uh, but anyway, um, well, well, thank you both for that. Uh, you know, Dr. Tooks, I, I, I wanted to follow up with you on, on a different question. Um, as a public health, health expert on this panel, it's actually a great segue. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the tensions um, throughout the pandemic between public health and politics. Um, you know, we've obviously had uh, politics injected into this pandemic to a degree, um, but you, you know, as a, as a public health expert, uh, do you feel better about the future uh, given the way you've seen local officials respond? Do you have, do you have concerns um, that there's more work to do here as far as um, kind of getting everyone uh, you know, kind of on a public health page together. I was just curious to kind of get your thoughts on, on that topic. Yeah, so it's interesting that I'm on this panel panel with Senator Garcia because uh, Senator Garcia and I worked together for years uh, in the Capitol and passed legislation that only had two no votes out of 160 legislators. So we're used to bipartisan public health interventions that work very well. Uh, it is my hope that as we move forward with COVID, uh, that we are able to, like Senator Garcia said, come together uh, with both parties on, on a single message because that, that's the most important, important path forward. And it does come down to education. When people understand um, the science behind uh, the vaccine, the science behind the mask, I think that everybody wants the best for our Miami community. Everybody wants the best for the world. And we have to figure out a way uh, to come together to, to make the, the evidence-based interventions uh, a reality. I, I am hopeful, you know, I don't really want to look too far in the past. 2020 was rough, uh, but here in uh, 2021, I'm very hopeful mostly because all sides have been very responsive to feedback. When we tell somebody that there's an issue, uh, a, a way that we could improve the processes for delivering the vaccine, improve the processes for, for, for signing up, anything, I think that the system has been very responsive and I think that that moves us on a path forward uh, towards, towards uh, ending the pandemic in our community. You know, people are over it, it's clear. I I'm over it. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm vaccinated and uh, I, I'm over it. I am concerned when I walk around Miami and I see that people are carousing uh, and uh, you know, very publicly in very packed areas. I think that there's a way to, for us to enjoy ourselves in this beautiful sunny city, but do it safely uh, so it's my hope that that moving forward, we, the businesses are able to adapt to to the safest way. Because you know, people like me who used to eat at restaurants seven days a week, I'm not going. So obviously, the restaurants are hurting. <laughs> Tons of people like me are, are aren't eating out every day. So I think that once people have the confidence that the restaurants are doing things safely, everybody who's uh, I, I I do think that we are. Uh, it's an auspicious time. We're we're on the path forward. 
and um, I think for sure uh, getting vac vaccinated is a, an in incentive for people is the, the hope of returning to, to normal. Well, doctor, if you've been eating every day out in the uh, eating out every day, I, I hope you invite me after the pandemic's <laughs> over. Come on, absolutely, Senator Garcia. Yeah, absolutely. But is it isn't it pretty neat? I mean, if if there's one thing good that comes out of the pandemic, I don't know if you agree with me on this or not. But you know, I've I've been fighting against healthcare disparities in the legislature ever since I got elected. And every time you speak on healthcare disparities, it goes in one ear and goes out the other. It doesn't matter the race because people don't want to, want to hear about it. We know that you know black and brown communities have always been affected the most. But I, I think one of the good things that have come out of this is that we now realize the truth is out there. It's not just Renee or, or Dr. Hanson talking about um, healthcare disparities and the issues that we have in Miami-Dade County. It is evident and it is clear. I think where we the next step after we get through this pandemic is making sure that we do have adequate access to health care for our, for our residents, for our minority communities, for our migrant communities that are out in the fields working, and especially our urban core area. You know, we see for far too long that, you know, we have a couple of community health centers that are in some of these communities, but we have to do a better job of making sure that we get people connected to primary care uh, providers so they, you know, so they can have a better way of taking care of, of all their ailments and not end up in the emergency rooms like they usually do. So I think that's the one silver lining. I think, um, I mean, there's a couple of silver lining, maybe because I'm pretty hopeful, but I think that's the one thing that I think we could all agree that we can do a much better job at ensuring that people have access to healthcare. Absolutely. So Ben, on the following the science, one thing I will say, I, you know, I'm pretty proud of the, the, the political and government leadership in Dade County, County, Miami Beach, Miami, et cetera, et cetera that really early on, we were the first to shut down. We were the first to close the beach. We were usually the last to reopen and quickly reclose again. I mean, I think we did try to follow the science as best we can. Um, you know, we struggled sometimes with what was going on in Tallahassee and in Washington. Uh, but I think as a local community, uh, we understood uh, that we had to protect ourselves. To me, the, the, the political part of it that was probably most frustrating, and we still see, is really how things like masks or social distancing uh, became so political. And not just political from a partisan perspective, just even political from a personal perspective. You know, the stories you read about people getting into fights and, at a, you know, a Publix in Hialeah or a, at a CBS in Miami Beach over things like that. Um, and all you people were asking was to respect one another's health and decency. You know, South Florida was challenging. Our DNA is not to be socially distant. Our right. DNA and our economy is actually dependent on people being socially completely uh, not distant, but uh, on top of each other and dancing and being on the beach and, and packing restaurants. And, and so the fact that, you know, a group of political leaders, uh, you know, decided to shut hotels and beaches and really turn our economy down um, w w was a serious decision, and and I know a lot of people on this you know call uh, struggled with it, but they, but the economy, and I think the business sector, respected it, and it also highlighted to Senator Garcia's point, not just you know the difference between you know uh, people of color and, and not in terms of the disparity, but even the disparity between our, the frontline workers that we don't think about, whether it's the grocery store worker, you know the the, the waiter at a hotel and whatnot, who literally live paycheck to paycheck and. And that this kind of pandemic, you know, has so uh, uh, created an incredible disparity uh, and, and loss and, and economic loss in their lives. And how do we, as we emerge, emerge in a resilient way that recognizes not only do we have to, you know, get back to working and whatnot, but how do we, with those sectors and hospitality being a critical one, how do we make the resilience so that the people in that sector are making enough money to really have a way of life, have insurance, and can take care of their families? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's been my experience as a Miami Beach resident has been kind of, you know, a series of, of markers over the course of the pandemic. I remember when the beaches were shut down and how eerie that was. I remember when the parks opened back up and being able to play tennis with, with friends again here in Miami Beach and how uh, really beneficial that was. Someone in, in the chat brought up mental health aspect of that. I would imagine that's part of what you all were considering was, okay, the science seems to support being outside uh, kind of distance from each other are, is safe. Um, let's open up the, the tennis courts again. I mean, could you walk us through some of these decisions, both how they relate to, to tourism and, and what you're going to invite there, but also how you're going to handle uh, city facilities like that when, when you were over at Miami Beach? Well, remember, um, the learning on this virus changed over time, right? I mean, 
Early on, they said, you don't wear masks. And they obviously said, you have to wear masks. Early on, wiping surfaces was the most incredible thing you had to do. And then, well, maybe not so serious. You know, early on, we, no one knew if that there was such a difference in indoor and outdoor. Um, and so, you know, we've adjusted as we went along. Um, but we, you know, we overreacted probably early, you know, out of abundance and caution, and then have, you know, uh, tried to, to change going forward. Uh, and I think hopefully the best learning that we have now will be reflected. Outdoor is wonderful. You know, the commission recently, Senator Garcia and his colleagues voted to expand uh, the amount of outdoor seating for restaurants to make permanent some of the changes in the rules that have been made to facilitate that, recognizing that that is going to be how people are going to re-engage with the, at least with restaurants, and also perhaps give us a competitive advantage with the rest of the you know, country because you can sit outside of Miami pretty much year round not necessarily the case elsewhere. So, so doubling down on some of the advantages we may have with that. Um, how we treat our government facilities, exactly. I mean, we're gonna continue you know, masks and PPE and all that stuff for a while, um, but slowly but surely, I think we'll uh, retrofit our facilities, our chillers and whatnot for it, the, the new normal, uh, uh, whatever that'll be. Uh, and government will probably lead on that and then help uh, the private sector uh, and at times even you know, incentivize and to provide technical assistance to make sure they're implementing the best uh, technology to remain open uh, for our economy. Thanks for that. Uh, we have about three minutes left. I want to get two more questions in, if possible, for Rahel and Senator Garcia. Rahel, uh, how is the mayor's office viewing this stretch of the, the pandemic, this kind of final stretch here, and and what are the major challenges ahead that that you see, and how how are you going to confront those challenges? Uh, thank you so much, Ben. Um, I mean, we're, you know, as Dr. Page said, we're, uh, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're, we're certainly not uh, completely out of it. So we, you know, the mayor has been uh, pretty consistent on her messaging that uh, please continue to wear your mask, continue to be vigilant, uh, social distancing, hand washing. These are all important, you know, campaigns that are gonna, that are gonna continue. Um, but as we, you know, get more supply and more vaccine, um, the next question, as many have said on this, will be, well, how do we overcome that vaccine hesitancy, right? How do we uh, make sure that this is um, an opportunity that's available to, to everyone, but that they want it, right? And, and so that is, the next, uh, that is the next challenge. But uh, again, working with our, our community organizations and to what Senator has said, you know, you have to go into these communities. You have to knock on doors and you, you, it's not just a flyer. So I absolutely agree. It's a conversation. It's trusted messengers. It's, you know, investment in, in these communities. And, uh, and that is something that we are, we are preparing. We are gearing up for. We are building our capacity to do. Um, and so definitely it's on, it's on our radar. Thank you. And, and this, this question is mine, Senator, so if it's a bad one, you can, you can blame me for this. But uh, you know, I spoke to a lot of uh, public health experts over the last um, few weeks, and, and they say the outlook for our next pandemic depends a lot on whether we actually learn the lessons from this one. And that's often framed in, in the context of public health funding and Department of Health funding. You obviously served in the Florida legislature. Do you view that as a realistic option for us in the state of Florida? Could we be looking at increases of public health funding or, or do you think that that's not so realistic? How do you, how do you view that? No, I, I, I think that um, uh, politicians and the elected officials up in Tallahassee have to understand that they, we need to put more money in public health. Look, for the last couple of years, the money in public health has been weaning away. And, um, and when I was chairman of, um, of the Health Appropriations Committee, we really did a we, we try to put even more money into public health, understanding the needs, especially the fact that our public health departments are county run there's, or county specific, and they're the best ones to address the needs of those counties, as opposed to other states that maybe be uh, one centralized county health department itself or central or run out of the capital. So the fact that we have 67 different county health departments with different needs and, and we can use them um, a lot more efficient and in a more efficient way by making sure that they provide some, you know, provide the healthcare needs for those communities. So I'll tell you this, yes, I'm very optimistic. I'm very, I, I see I see that um, I've been having conversations with uh, Wilton Simpson, the Senate president and the Speaker of the House on some of the things that they can do and some of the ways that they can implement, you know, new budget uh, authorities to the county health departments to make sure that we do focus on the health needs of our community. Look, at the end of the day, you know, we fix a lot of the healthcare issues and healthcare crises that we may face um, 
through education. And I think this is the time to make sure that we continue to educate our folks. And as Jimmy was talking, and I call him Jimmy because I've known him for so many years, um, but as the CEO was, was talking about earlier, you know, what the pandemic has taught us is that we went down uncharted territories. Um, and we try to, everything became so political. We were pointing the fingers at one another, but we didn't know what we were doing. Even the experts didn't know what they were doing. So as the pandemic evolved, we've had evolved with it and so have our policies. But what we should learn from it, exactly what we should definitely learn is to make sure that this doesn't happen. We can never stop it from happening again, but when it happens again, that we're ready for it. I think the reason that we got it into this situation um, it's not so, you could, some people could blame it on politics, but I think the reason we got into this situation because we have gotten so far away from public health um, and the identity and what public health really means that when we had this pandemic, we didn't have the infrastructure in place in a lot of our states. Uh, so I, I think I really do feel good about where we are. And this is another, this is one of the other silver lines that I was talking about. I really do think that public health now in the next couple of years is gonna see an increase in funding. Uh, and um, and you're going to see a more visual visual um, effect of our county health departments working more collaboratively with our county governments and local municipalities to ensure that we do have a robust healthcare system that we do have access for individuals uh, that look like me uh, that we do have uh, testing and access to treatment uh, for individuals and making sure that we don't leave our our, our uh, our minority communities behind. Uh, and, and that's, I think, is, is a positive step. And I think that we, um, I, I do see the light at the end of the tunnel as it relates to the vaccines, but I, I do also see the light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to uh, elevating our public health. Um, you know, the doctor has done a great job with, um, with the, um, we've done with a great job with the HIV and with a needle exchange program. You know, th these are all public health issues. That a lot of people really want to talk about and you know right. this is what we need to continue to do and grow so i thank see that you. we can benefit from it thank you we are we are out of time it's a great note to end on it's been a great discussion um i want to thank all of you for for joining me today and i'm going to turn it back over to irene and thanks for following along perfect that was wonderful so my thanks to dr doctors pages andrews tooks uh chief morales uh, commissioner garcia senior advisor Rahil, well, they use, I want to say it beautifully. It's so lyrical. I, I'll get it next time, I promise you. No, and, and thank you. And thank you, Ben, for leading this discussion. I agree with you all. Uh, listen, this time last year, businesses were starting to bring their employees right home. Think of where we've come. And now I think we've got a great three months ahead of us. I am optimistic that we're going to come a long way. We've got great people in our community that are leading the way. Everything that you said makes a lot of sense to me. And I do think all of those seniors who went first with that vaccine, my case, my 94-year-old mother was the first one to get it. As soon as Jackson had it, she said, absolutely, I'm going to get it. And she rolled up her sleeve. And I think she's going to basically pave the way, like many other seniors, for the rest of us to do the right thing and get our vaccines, right? So thank you again. I thought this was tremendous. It was a great program. So my chamber family, I have three things that I'm going to leave you with. We can't talk about, we can't close out a luncheon without talking about anniversaries. These are the corporations that are um, committed to our chamber. I want to celebrate four big anniversaries. Jungle Island, trustee member, 71 years. We can't go back. We can't wait to get back there, Jungle Island. We will be there soon. Um, also, Jackson Health System at 44 years. We also have Carnival at 43 and Holland and Knight at 40 years. So congratulations on those anniversaries. And you can see on your screen, there's, there's several more. Also, I'd like to introduce uh, four new trustee members. Uh, that have joined the chamber. First of all, is a big shout out to trustee platinum member, Starbucks Coffee Company. Well, they set out to be a company that all not only celebrates coffee, but the connection that people have around coffee. So we're very happy to welcome Starbucks and they are represented by Manuel Sardui. So Starbucks, welcome as a trustee member. Then we have Beach Haas Lodging, represented by our very own Alejandra Collarte. 
uh, Beach Haas Lodging, where home meets hotel. Isn't that a wonderful concept? They own and operate luxury, fully equipped, short-term rental properties in premier locations in South Florida. Welcome Beach Haas to our chamber. Then we have uh, EO, EO, EOLEN, EOLEN America, represented by Xavier Ravel, a 100% Spanish-owned family business, national leader in providing general services to company. Welcome to our chamber. And then lastly, Gensler, represented by Diana Farmer-Gonzalez. Gensler is a global architecture design and planning firm with 50 locations and more than 6,000 professionals. Their Miami office is right now located in Wynwood. So welcome, Gensler. So hey, uh, that's a tough one. It's ULEN America. Oh, thank you for the correction. ULEN America. Very good. And thank you for correcting me on the, uh, on the name. Looking forward to April. You know that April is, uh, you know, baseball starts, right? So we're going to have a wonderful uh, luncheon uh, for the April trustee luncheon. You're not going to miss it. You know why you're not going to miss it? Because we're going to have two really interesting women who lead in baseball right here with the Marlins. So we're going to have general manager Kim Ang as well as our chief operating officer, Caroline O'Connor. That's going to be in April. You're not going to miss it. April 7th, noon. Don't miss it. Please put it on your calendars. I thank you very much for your attention, everyone. Thank you for your comments on chat. And we are adjourned. Have a great rest of the week.